trying to get back to the basics of great products. Power comes from sharing information. I try to convince people to slow down. Free. Yeah. Open. This is the Soak Tyson Podcast. Welcome to Soak by Slush Podcast. Um, here are your host, Ona, and in Copenhagen we have Isaac. Isaac, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Ona. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing fantastic as well. Um, we have a very interesting guest today here. With us is Hanno Renner from Personio. Hi, Hanno. Hi, Ona. Hi, Isaac. Great to be here. It's awesome nice to, to have you, you here. Um, do you want to give a quick introduction to who you are, what you do, what is Personio? Yeah, happy to share that in a few sentences. So I'm um, Hanno, co-founder and CEO at Personio. Uh, we are an HR platform for SMEs uh, focused on the European market and on companies between 10 and 2,000 employees. We are digitizing the entire employee lifecycle from recruiting, uh, onboarding, managing and developing employees as well as running their payroll. And uh, we've started the company in 2015 in Munich, where I am today, but by now we're uh, around uh, 800 people across Europe with offices in uh, Madrid, London, Dublin, and uh, Amsterdam. And yeah, that's a quick summary of where we are today and uh, still at the early innings of the journey and uh, a lot of stuff still ahead of us. Thanks, Hanno. Um, yeah, today we're going to talk a little bit more about purpose-driven uh, entrepreneurship and how to build or embed sustainability into into startups. Um, you're a B2B um, HR software, so you're not solving SDGs. Um, but would you consider your purpose-driven uh, company and how do you define purpose-driven entrepreneurship? So I think for me, purpose-driven entrepreneurship, um, it's, it's really about what, what drives you as a business and what you're trying to achieve, whether a lot of a kind of business school uh, one-on-one on founding a company is find a market where you can make some money and then you have a business model and you can grow that and that's that's probably right uh, however i think what was driving us from the beginning was not uh, finding an area where, where we can make money but finding an area where we can have a positive impact on people through technology and um, on the one hand that was really by digitizing a space where which is undigitized where we can really um, enable people to to then focus on on in this case hr people to focus on the uh, the rest of the people in the organization and, and thereby uh, making those companies more successful and really uh, having an impact on their lives on a day-to-day -day basis but also and equally important uh, for us from the beginning wasn't just about uh, yeah, selling our product and, and having impact on customers, but also uh, building a great place to work for our employees, uh, building a company that has, an, uh, yeah, has a positive impact on, on uh, the employees, but also beyond uh, the borders of the company with environment and society. And there's a couple of actions we've been, been taking over the years, which I'm sure we'll, we'll be touching on in this podcast. Yeah, we'll get to that later. Um, cool. How do you, do you think that there is a difference between purpose-driven entrepreneurship and other kinds of entrepreneurship are regular and how does that kind of show in everything a startup does? So, I mean, I think, for example, one one area where it does uh, make a difference is really what you're, you're focusing on and how, what you do internally, what you remind your people on a day-to-day -day basis. You can, of course, uh, just set a revenue target and then keep reminding people, okay, this is how far we are. And, and that's what, that's the only, the purpose of the business is, is making money. And I think uh, there's a famous uh, economist saying in the, uh, the business of business is making business. And uh, I think we're, uh, we're doing a business, but at the same time, we also feel we have a, a broader purpose. And therefore from uh, the beginning on, when we started the company, we first of all defined our core purpose, which is enabling better organizations which we define as the reason we exist, which we are pursuing forever as a company. It's also not something which we'll, we'll ever really reach, but something which almost like an author that we can always go, go after. And th that per core purpose, um, and then everything that follows below that, uh, when it comes to our goal setting process, our BHAC and our, our vision on a, that we're refining over time, always plays into that. And I think uh, as a purpose-driven organization, uh, you also, um, 
are not just having that somewhere written in, on the, the company page, but really it's something you, you spend a lot of time talking about. So for example, every Friday afternoon in our weekly all team meeting, the very first slide uh, after the, the headline slide is uh, enabling better organizations. Every every week, I remind our, uh, everyone about why, uh, why that, that's the reason to exist, why we're doing this and uh, how we're uh, kind of working towards that and try, of course, to, to tie it in a bit of a story so it's not always just the same slide and we're repeating the same words, but essentially it's really kind of focusing on this is the reason we exist and this is what we're here for. And I think that's also for a lot of people, uh, of at least uh, that the ones that work at Personio, the driving force for them to come to work every day. This all sounds fantastic. I, I agree with a lot of what you say, but I still want to challenge you on some of the practical things. I really want to get mm -hmm. to know more what this actually means in the on the day-to-day -day basis. Like, do you see the purpose-driven aspect of running your company as something uh, that has a bit of a tension with the business side of it? Because you are still a business that wants to make a profit and achieve competitive advantage and all these other classical uh, business terms and concepts that are, I mean, they're your lifeline on, in one sense. Do you see that there's a tension between the concept of your purpose that you somehow integrated into all this, uh, into your business plan? Or do you see that they are mutually, uh, uh, mutually sort of uh, beneficial or both maybe? Yeah, um, so I think there's there's tensions are not just between uh, the purpose, but also of course uh, our values that that underpin uh, our core purpose. Where, for example, one is social responsibility, and uh, one tension that uh, does arise uh, on a regular basis is companies that um, or organizations that are not aligned with our values, looking to buy our product. And um, that in the beginning came up as, as a first like, oh, there's now this right wing party that's uh, against immigrants, against uh, uh, that's that's racist and that they want to buy our product what are we going to do and back then it was kind of uh, we were still i think 50 or 80 people at a time and and i then just wrote, wrote an email myself back to that lead saying that we're not gonna uh, serve serve them with our product but then uh, of course that doesn't scale to 800 people where i'm reviewing every lead that comes in uh, so we by now had defense companies or, or other companies that just didn't feel they're matching with our values come in trying to become a customer and so we had to set up um sort of a, what we call now a sales exclusion policy of uh, companies or industries which we don't want to serve and uh, have that publicly communicated to the sales team so even in an early stage in the conversations we can uh, disqualify some people which we don't feel match our values. How important do you think is kind of drawing those big lines in the kind of early on making those decisions that might seem hard that kind of guide the business later on and did you have to make many of those or is that kind of the the one key thing that the decision that you made um so i do think that those things come up over time again i think every single decision you take will be seen by everyone in the organization and the consistency of those decisions is really important it's really hard to say okay let's first become a, a a big business and, and take in all the companies we might not want to serve later on and then we can still get rid of them when we have enough rec brand recognition and so on but of course that that's not how it's going to work because you're you're not um, yeah you're not consistent in, in your arguments you're not consistent in, in the values and i think that's that's really where uh, yeah every every decision you do also internally how you treat uh, treat your people internally um how uh, what you prioritize uh, also now in the, in the last year, of course, with with Corona, there's there's been a lot of of challenges. Uh, and, and what do you do there when you when you hear that uh, at the, towards the end of uh, of lockdown? Now, luckily, things start to open up, vaccinations increase. But I think a lot of you, both of you, maybe uh, felt it as well. But a lot of people have felt sort of in the January period where the speed of vaccination was super slow, weather was uh, bad, and, and we really had uh, a lot of people having mental issues. And and then again, you could just say, okay. But we still have these goals and this is what you have to work on let's just power through or uh, you can try to find ways how you can support them um, we, we back then implemented uh, self-care days where people uh, are purposely besides a vacation uh, forced to take a uh, half day off and do just something that, that feels good to them and that, that they enjoy and i think all of these are of course small things and that i'm not going to say this is now changing the world or making a big difference but these little ways how you direct new challenges how do you address certain things and are you consistent in how you do that? Uh, those um, are the things that then ultimately, I think, build your brand and build the, um, the trust also that, that comes uh, from, from your employees and, and the people that work with you broadly.
So am I reading correct the line is, uh, is the purpose driven aspect also as much in the sort of informal side of uh, side of things and not just the sort of formal guidelines and policies that you uh, you have? Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, ideally, it, it educates. Ideally, it's not. Of course, sometimes it's it's decisions where you where you discuss uh, in the management and founder team and where you actually have a bit of yeah, have to find an agreement. But I think overall, it's uh, it should feel feel natural in a lot of ways, and it, sh it shouldn't even be like, oh, now we're, we should we really do that? Although it's opposed to the business, but like, yeah, this is the right thing to do. Uh, that's what what we want to do. And I don't think there's sort of the the one umbrella saying, okay, this is a purpose-driven organization. That's why they do X, Y, Z. And this is one that's not. And I'm also uh, not sure where where to classify Personio, but I do think we're we're tr trying to be quite conscious and we're trying to be quite consistent in the way we do things and the way uh, we act, um, as that's also not just that important um, to, to, to our customers, uh, to our employees, but also to our customers. Maybe to, to share one quick example there, there uh, uh, you probably uh, might remember uh, end of last year where there was the, the climate strike and then we uh, allowed our employees to, to take part as well. And, um, and then we put a banner up uh, on the login page of Personia. It's visits by hundreds of thousands of people every single day uh, that we're supporting uh, that and that we're, we're giving our people uh, to time off. And of course, there were some customers that, that were, uh, I don't know, denying climate change or whatever, but they were definitely not happy of us uh, promoting that on the login page, which their employees also accessed. Um, and um, and that, that's something which we then ha had to live with that backlash uh, while still uh, believing that it was the right thing to do. Uh, and we did it again recently in a, in a climate action week. And um, I think those are also some of the things where you just have to say, okay, I'm standing my ground, I'm, I'm being consistent here, because while there's some companies that might then say, okay, I don't wanna work with that business anymore, I think there's equally a lot more that feel like I, I really want to do business with this company. I want to be engaged with them in the long term because I feel that they're doing the right things. Right. Integrity must, a bit, must be a big part of, of a business or as a purpose driven business. It, it's, it gets a whole new meaning. And then also it was interesting what you said there in the beginning. I sometimes hear uh, this, uh, I hear it said about purpose driven business that, that it's this very abstract concept that's not like it's not defined in a specific way. So like, what can I do with this concept? But like there are if you think about the term purpose in general, it's not an easy concept that you could just fit into a box. Like if you talk about the purpose for your uh, for your own life, even or something. And like, it's not the justice or love, even those are also concepts that are not easy definable, but that doesn't mean that they are not important. So would you agree with this philosophical statement? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. It's, it's, it's really, uh, yeah, there is no, okay, the, now you get the, the stamp in your right. purpose driven organization. Uh, but it is it, like, I think it's, it's really, you know, like you said, integrity in the, doing what you say and saying what you do. And it's like, if you say, this is what defines us, this is what is important to us, this is our values, and this is what we're trying to do as a business. And then you're actually following through on these things. I think that just gives you that level of repeal consistently. And I think you can destroy some of that, that trust very easily and quickly that you build up uh, uh, hard over time. But um, yeah, uh, I think that's, that's important. Do you ever struggle with the balance of kind of having strong and clearly defined values and then inclusivity because of course then if you kind of define that our values are this and we stand for this but not for that you kind of well exclude people who don't have the same values or for example who don't believe in climate change or don't believe in kind of i don't know spending their time for that um and how do you do you have to balance that often or was it a clear choice um so I think a lot of our values. I mean, our our values are not uh, political beliefs, and and we we don't uh, we don't have written down. If you want to work for Personio, you should uh, vote for that party, and uh, and you should support these kind of five courses. Uh, and and uh, unless you're uh, you're not a good employee, I think it's more about some of the the broader terms that really can just still include a lot of people, um, such as um, I mean. Our, value, our values around transparency, ownership, social responsibility, team spirit, and uh, so on. I think they they are really important, and they are defining. They're excluding some people that don't don't really value the same things, but they're, they're not they're not as narrow as uh, and what's your political belief on that specific cause. Um, uh, on the other hand, when it comes to our operating principles, which are a bit more even behaviors, 
again, I think they're not exclusive that we exclude a certain group, but they are, they are exclusive to a certain amount of people where it comes to things like seek to improve, uh, driven by impact again, um, at, uh, uh, be diligent. Those are, of course, some kind of behaviors which we look for in the recruiting process, and that where we decide against people. Um, but uh, that doesn't that doesn't make us uh, a less diverse uh, group of people from the types of backgrounds we are. But it does make us a, a less diverse group of people from the type of work styles and so on. Uh, but uh, that's, I think, is in our case at least uh, the, uh, <laughs> a, di a diminishing diversity which we value because we like to work uh, with people that that are aligned on those behaviors and, and values. So can I do a follow up? Because that was a really good question. And I'm curious, like, because we talked about scaling culture before on this on this podcast, but like, how do you how, how has a scaling purpose been for you? Have you encountered some of these challenges when you talk about a you, you get a multiplicity of different types of people? I mean, of course, you're controlling your hiring process. But still, I mean, you said the filter, you can't make the filter too tight. So how has this purpose scaling process been for you? So I think it's really like, I'm not sure whether that, like there's probably an overlap between purpose scaling and culture scaling, but I think on the one hand, yes, the hiring process um, is of course a key element. And um, and I think we, we are actually making the filter quite tight there. Like we've had 40,000 applicants over the past year and interviewed uh, and hired a little bit less than 400, so 0.8%. And we are very deliberate to also sometimes decline people that fit the role, but not the, the company culture. And uh, And then I think a lot about it is, what you like it's it's interesting how as the company grows uh, and we're still with with close to 800 people a small company but how important what you say becomes and how, how much people look to what you praise uh, what are the things where do you comment on slack on something what are the things that you bring up in an all team meeting i think you can shape quite a lot by the things so what are the, the examples you bring forward uh, which where you where you again of course ideally su supported by one of your values um, or uh, I mentioned the repetition I do every week about a core purpose what kind of stories do I do I use there to to support that I mean all of that of course shapes a certain way and is reinforcing uh, and I think um, especially as we're growing with 40 50 people every single month there's of course constantly this influx of new people, which you constantly have to uh, to keep on on the same loop as everyone else that's been in the business for three years. But even for them, I think that that regular repetition and that additional contact through new stories helps um, to to get everyone on the same page. That was a good question and good answer as well. Um, talking about kind of sustainability or purpose, was it clear for you when founding Personio already what kind of purpose you were looking for? What kind of I don't know, sustainability processes you would have in place or have they kind of grown throughout the Personio journey? And what's the timing of that? So when when did you do what and how did that evolve? Yeah, so I think there's two things. Too. So the, the purpose of the, the business of an Avian organization was something we set in, uh, in the beginning when we found a company to say, okay, well, we need to be aligned on what the, what's the reason we exist, how do we want to go after that? And then um, when it comes to more of the, the sustainability aspect, uh, it was something where we felt also early on that we have responsibility beyond the, the business, even, even though the, there was no business, there were uh, two, three people at the very beginning. Um, we, we, uh, we put 1% uh, of uh, the company into uh, what, what will become a, a foundation separate already and um and that's uh, something which we also set up early on so we also back then already realized that, that there's uh there's stuff we, we can and should be doing with with that uh with, that goes beyond the company and um, that foundation will be uh, founded also soon um but i think beyond that we've been over time of course uh, then implementing a lot of things around sustainability we have a sustainability committee which actually was founded by employees which again shows we were hiring for people that matched social responsibility value but then we didn't force anyone to build a sustainability committee but that's something that came up with them uh, so they they were kind of addressing that and looking for things that can have an impact uh, but we've also and i think that's something which um, companies can do at a very early stage already figure out what is the the impact you have as a business what are the and i think there's just twofold on the one hand you can of course uh, have you cause any any company any person anyone causes emissions and has a footprint so you can analyze what that footprint is uh, what are the, the levers to reduce it and what are the things you can't reduce which you can compensate 
but it's only the one side. And uh, for software business, there is a certain amount you can do. And we, we did all of these things and we're compensating. We're constantly trying to reduce our emissions as well, but also impacting some of our supplies and so on. But beyond that, you also, especially as a B2B business, you're selling to business, which you can influence and impact uh, as well again. And there was one small example with that banner we had on the Climate Action Week to also raise awareness and use reach of the millions of people using Personio. But beyond that, we also um, do things like a, a currently setting up a partnership uh, where we incentivize companies to also use the data out of Personio to run their own uh, and analysis of their CO2 emissions um, and to also then incentivize them to compensate them in these kind of things. So you can also use your lever you have on other, other people, uh, other companies, your customers, your employees, uh, the broader public to uh, raise awareness for topics, to incentivize people for it, to motivate people to do things in, the, in those directions. So I think there's, yeah, there's the one thing you can do on yourself and then there's the, the lever you have um, in the broader society. Following on that, I think um, many startups kind of feel that when they're in early stages, they don't have such big impact that they should focus on this yet, like on sustainability, for example. Um, but do you think that there are benefits from starting early, uh, building kind of sustainability pro- like processes and that kind of mindset into the company? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the... The one thing it always is easy to say also on an individual basis uh, it doesn't change if i switch to green power uh, because then there's still so many that don't and there's still the coal plants but still of course every little action ta- uh, kind of works and we we are serving small and medium-sized uh, companies ourselves and there's 1.7 million in europe and uh, there are two-thirds of the overall employment across europe so uh, if, if every single of these little uh, entities are changing, then of course uh, that has a big impact as well. Uh, but I think also, especially as a startup, when you typically start small, but you plan to grow to much bigger entity, starting early and, and putting these things in place just also sets a precedent by the kind of people you attract that help you continue to improve that uh, by kind of the, the awareness you may be raised by then some partners that, that might get aware uh, from what you're doing and i think that just uh, makes it easier as opposed to not caring about it for the first five years of your existence and all of a sudden say oh uh, what about sustainability or or even worse when you before you go public and then uh, it's forced to have a sustainability report uh, and then trying to for the first time think about it of course that's not going to be very impactful yeah i was just about to ask about uh, a practical question i think um, many startups also struggle with even though if they would have the kind of motivation to be sustainable or be purpose driven but they struggle with the very practical aspect of it so did you have a framework, a playbook, um, something that kind of got you started or how did you just start the process of, you talked about impact, um, How? what is your impact, how to measure it, how to reduce it, how to compensate it, how to make a bigger positive impact. So where where did you start? What was the kind of instructions you followed? Yeah, so I think, I mean, you can, you can do it in a bit more of a, pragmatic approach by just saying, okay, I'll, I'll look at um, uh, at some of the things I already see in front of me. Like for example, we already on without having a big analysis of it, uh, realized okay, probably flying within Germany just doesn't make sense. So we make a travel policy uh, to go by train uh, to places which can be reached uh, within a couple of hours where uh, probably most of the time is not just less environmental friendly, but also less uh, productive to, to go by plane anyway. But uh, I think those are these more like kind of tactical things you can do i think at some point it definitely makes sense to be a bit more systematic about it and um, there's a lot of partners and companies uh, such as planet league here in, uh, in berlin for example that um, help you analyze all your um, your emissions and uh, and go through step by step and really uncover all these areas where for example for us it was surprising how much emissions actually are caused by by some of the underlying partner technologies which we're using i mean aws our servers uh, are already uh, in uh, co2 um, uh, uh, free because they've they've run on uh, green power but a lot of the other the partners aren't and that made a big chunk of our uh, our footprint so we're now trying to to influence some of these partners to also switch to green power but i think those are um, some of the examples where you uh, where it's uh, where it's really nice to to have that overview and then to uncover and understand what are the things we can change and what are the levers we have 
and that's certainly a structured approach. Uh, I would recommend anyone to, to take that they want to get more serious to really understand what are the, the, the levers you have at hand to reduce your emissions. I'd like to talk to you, uh, to you about uh, being a um, purpose-driven employer and millennials. Let's talk about millennials because I'm a millennial. I think, you are, aren't you a millennial too? You, you look young. You're a millennial too, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we kind of, maybe we kind of share the worldview that, uh, this, so this general worldview that the, the sort, of, sort of narrow profit motive uh, isn't necessarily always good or doesn't always incentivize to good actions and uh, companies should deserve their social contract co- and then continually renew that justification. And, 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 but then I also think like maybe I also want to get paid for my job. So how do you see like your employees? Like how is the, how is the sort of employee values? How does that scape sort of play out in your, in your company? What do, uh, what do uh, uh, your employees actually value? And what are some of the myths that we take? Because we say that millennials only care about ex- experiences, but I mean, that's not completely true, isn't it? Yeah, no, I think, I think we, we, we do, we're not all, I guess, away from we're not we're not the second uh, or the, we're not the first generation post-war anymore we were kind of just the second or third and thereby uh, like we've we've all we're not as much in this oh i need to uh, make a lot of money to to then have a better life for my children uh, i think uh, a lot of people at least uh, besides uh, climate change and, uh, and some of the more immediate topics care about a fair society where uh, they they can maintain the standard of living their children uh, are not uh, going to be living in uh, as currently in some areas uh, in the us where we can't send your uh, children uh, outside uh, your house anymore because it's just not uh, the, the social um, dynamics have shifted in a way that it's not not sa- uh, safe in a lot of these places anymore and then which people pay themselves guards to guard their homes which is just a ridiculous society where while uh, other people are homeless on the streets and i think uh, it's a lot about that that fairness, which, which me and I think a lot of people from our generation strive for. Um, but I think one area that also comes with that, of course, within a company like Bisonio, uh, we, like, we all, everyone is, is well educated and they have, they have decent pay and decent job as it is, but still there's a difference, of course, how do you zip, distribute now the value that's being generated? How much is flowing back to the investors? How much is flowing into the, uh, the founders? And, and what do you do with, uh, and how do you distribute these kind of things? And I think when you think, and when you believe in a, in a fair society where we're, uh, where you wanna have, uh, that you're not a communist sort of society, but we wanna have a society that also uh, doesn't constantly have an, an increasing wealth gap between rich and poor, um, I think, Helping close that white gap is also by distributing benefits from a from a company a success more equally. And hence, we've made everyone at Pisonio a, a shareholder in the company. Although, unfortunately, current restrictions in Europe are not as easy to do that yet. Uh, we'd love to see them change, but nevertheless, we found ways to do so. And therefore, everyone from uh, the cleaning staff to the C level uh, is part of the company. And uh, as the company increases in value, grows, and and becomes more successful, uh, they also uh, their stocks gain in value and therefore they also participate in the success of the business um, uh, as opposed to just uh, yeah having having founders and investors benefit yeah i think we should talk about this more because this is very interesting uh how uh how did you go about doing this uh or do you want to say is this a secret how did you go around the uh current regulatory I mean, it's, it's not a secret. There is, um, they're called uh, virtual stock option plans. So essentially, you have a have a contract with with your your employees that uh, you transfer them a certain amount of shares that, of course, dilute everyone else in the, on the cap table, uh, just like regular shares. Um, they are the, they have the same value as regular shares. They have the same upside as regular shares. The only difference is that um, that's the unfortunate part from regular regu- regulatory part is um, that uh, they are taxed uh, differently uh, towards the employees. And again, I think that's that's in the society from a society standpoint unfair because uh, I pay less tax on on my shares of the business than than those virtual shares we we give to employees, which I think shouldn't be the case. Uh, but still, of course, uh, they uh, they still get the the, ben- the benefits from those um, those shares and, and uh, get the upside 
as the company is successful. And we're in fact already not just at some point in the future by an IPO, but already now in our recent funding rounds, we've uh, started to offer employees that have been with us for a couple of years already uh, to uh, allow them to sell parts of their share so if they wanted to. And uh, some did and some some uh, thereby already gained some returns and the majority says they want to keep holding on to them and keep having them gain value, which of course is also great. But I think that also um, yeah shows this this benefit of liquidity and you know, of course also fosters uh, or gives uh, especially some of the early employees uh, afterwards enough financial freedom to maybe gone on to to start their own ventures and again that also supports uh, an entire ecosystem uh, more broadly yeah that's a great idea how um how has this affected sort of uh, i don't know has it affected your uh, your company culture in any way or, or do, do, do you sort of feel the sense of ownership that has been made concrete by this model? I think, I mean, we, we've always uh, had a lot of, uh, like a lot of people have shares. We didn't have it as drastically um, until I think two years ago, we implemented that everyone gets shares before we had the majority, but, uh, but now we have everyone, two years, since two years with everyone. I don't think there was a, a big shift because we already before has felt a strong sense of pride being part of a company and strong sense of, Binding, uh, but I think it's just again is is again consistent with we talk about consistently early on. If people are really proud of and, and feel part of a company, they should also have a share in that. And, and therefore, I think uh, that's coming back to the purpose driven uh, part of the company. I do think there's a benefit, and I recommend it to any company uh, to do so anyway. But even if it didn't, it's the right thing to do to have people participate. And therefore, I think that's also comes back to the what decisions do you take for what reasons. And uh, if, even if there was no measurable success uh, or benefit from, from that program, uh, I think it would still make sense to do it. I have a question on that. Uh, how have your investors or investors you pitched to, um, how have they reacted to this kind of given employees these um, options as well? Uh, has it been positive or cautious or what's the kind of reaction to this? Uh, so I know that there's uh, some investors that, that aren't uh, supporting these things as much. We are lucky that we have a very strong bench of support, investors supporting us. Also, I mean, Index Ventures, one of our largest investors, is very public about uh, the support as well, um, trying to, to also help change regulation uh, in that uh, by funding the not optional campaign, but also uh, the other funds, Excel, and also on GFC, Lightspeed, uh, and so on. That that we we have on board uh, have have never questioned that. I mean. Uh, I'm not sure whether they would have actively proposed it, uh, but but they also uh, they, they were supporting our proposal and our efforts, and they were equally also supporting. Uh, talked about this one percent equity which we set aside in the beginning, which of course would have diluted over time as investors came in. And at some point, at our Series B or C, we um, we convinced investors to that they also chip in, so it's a non-dilutive stake, um, uh, and and therefore even uh, on that front. Our investors were also supportive, which I'm super grateful for. Actually, that in, the investor side of things is interesting. Uh, in in general, when it comes to this purpose driven entrepreneurship, how has uh, the investor influence been in this equation? Has there been uh, has there been any tension from that side, or has it mostly been just supportive and like go Hano? <laughs> um, so, I have to. I mean the. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with our investors, and therefore I think they, they deserve all the praise. Yeah, sorry, I did I ask you a tricky it. question? No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, okay, okay uh, good. That, no, 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 all good. I'm just going to say it is uh, like Personio has developed, I think, well so far. There's still a lot of ways for us to go, but I think, uh, uh, of course, for our investors, uh, the investment paid off uh, already for, for most of them, and uh, and therefore, of course, it's always easier to uh, to, uh, as in as a company that maybe struggles on, on other terms, so therefore, uh, I think giving a little bit of a caveat uh, here. So I don't, I don't know how that would have been uh, otherwise. But I have to say they've uh, they have been very supportive in a, way, a lot of ways. And I think the the mindset I have that also I share with my investors, and I think they are aligned with, is really if we as a company first of all focus on the purpose and enabling better organizations, supporting our customers make sure that we build a great uh, workplace where our employees thrive. And if we then also look a bit outside on our society and environment, if we do these three things well, and if we focus on those, our investors don't 
to acquire any focus because they will automatically the company will be successful and then they they will will gain the returns and i think that's the the uh, the order uh, of of how you how you should think about things and not uh, because investors uh, our investors have been very supportive they're very important to our success um but by focusing on investors interests only um you're probably not a sustainably a long-term successful company as if you focus on customers employees and society and therefore i think overall again this focus is aligned with investor interests because it pays off for them i think that's the short answer yeah if you think about investors in a in a broader terms not just your investors getting you out of the spot a little bit um what do you think that investors could do better to help and enable companies with their sustainability and purpose so is there something practical or some yeah something practical investors could do better or the way they could support companies better with this so i think of course there's the, the range between the investor being opposed to some of these actions and then pushing against uh, and the investor pushing for it and then i think in between is the investor supporting if the founder supported i think it, it does make sense especially I and mean, we were first time founders ourselves but especially also for other first time founders to to be explicit especially uh, if you're an investor on on the on the, the left side of, of this equation uh, by where you at least supportive of such actions if not even uh, asking for that you're, you're voicing that uh, uh, to to the to the uh, founders uh, so they are if they're maybe shy about proposing some of these things and feel like oh uh, that might be um, might be yeah, wrongly regarded i think really pushing for that is, is the one thing and um, of course we're trying to to play our uh, our part as well by by promoting some of these actions and showing how they have helped us be successful and thereby hopefully motivating both uh, other founders to, to also try some of these uh, changes, but also other investors to to recognize that their companies might also be doing better by focusing on on uh, their employees and and some of the other things we mentioned. Before you uh, had any sort of uh, closed any funding rounds, uh, did you use any sort of screening, or you mentioned the arguments that you had that you sort of conceived up? And they then told to the investors sort of make sure that okay if we do these three things then we are going to make it and like and, and sort of convince them that way but was was there a process of screening and sort of seeing whether or not the values matched even before anything was closed or how was how, how was that experience from your perspective and also the purpose-driven thing yeah so we spent a lot of time uh, uh, from every, uh, any of our funding rounds uh, getting reference calls on specifically not just the fund themselves, but really the, the individual that would join our boards or uh, sort of partner we'd be working with. And of course, spending time with that partner as well. And I think throughout those conversations, spending a lot of time with each other, you kind of, again, I think it's it's a similar, I would give a similar answer as with the values we have inside your company. You don't have to agree, uh, I'm not going to ask the partners, what do you vote for and what's your, your political position here, but, uh, but do you, uh, try, uh, do you value this? Uh, have the same values as as we have, and and from these kind of things comes then then also, I guess the trust uh, to say okay, if we are aligned on values, they will also trust me to do some of the things I want to do, and and give me some of that freedom, and I think that then we'll we'll get get that support uh, for the right things, and we'll be successful as a business, and um, I think that's yeah some of the things we 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 did uh, we did not look for. Uh, social uh, uh, kind of the, this uh, social responsibility uh, page on their website uh, to analyze that because I think that's oftentimes you can write a lot of things on there, uh, but really looking in depth on what is a person that you'll be working with and is uh, is that person supporting you? I think it's important. A follow up on that, and this might be the stupidest question I've asked in this podcast, but sometimes the stupidest questions are the best questions. Uh, do you like sometimes when you meet your girlfriend's parents for their boyfriend's parents for the first time you don't bring up subjects like politics or worldview or stuff like this like do you see that there's the same dynamic when you're talking to maybe an investor who's trying to invest to you like it's easier to talk about the financial normal stuff that there's a social contract that you're allowed to talk about but do you find that there's a it's a difficult space to bring up these pur purpose-driven things and how would you go about it did you do you have any thoughts surrounding this so i think i mean on the one hand you, like 
the investor is not just a conversation with you and the investor, right? You, you like you, you have a certain like communicate on your website and your social media channels. There's a certain way you to portray yourself. So you, you, know, you hopefully, if you have some sort of integrity, not not trying to go to the investors and present a completely different company because that's that's also not like right. that's not what they want want because they want to have, see what kind of company is that and is there a match and should we invest as a company? Will that be successful? Uh, and and yeah, therefore, therefore, I think that should anyway not happen. Um, and then I think uh, when it comes to practically addressing some of the things, I mean, for example, our one uh, percent clause is part of our shareholding agreement. Our shareholder agreement they have to sign, so it's anyway part of the, the process. So we of course informed them uh, about that, and, and they were all uh, very supportive about it. Um, that being said, I, I again don't know how uh, it would have played out if if we were doing poorly the business and and all of the great investors we're now fortunate enough to will be working with would not have uh, wanted to invest. And uh, and then there's just this one investor that says, okay, you can't uh, have that clause. Otherwise the company is going bankrupt. That's a, of course a, a tricky situation uh, you're in then. Uh, fortunately, we, we haven't been in that situation, um, but still I think uh, if you are in, in some some shape uh, in a position to do so, then you, you at least have to lift the integrity and the pushing for the things that you value. Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, I think we are finishing, uh, heading to the finish of this episode. Do you have anything to ask uh, still, Ona? No, I think this has been pretty comprehensible. Um, comprehensive. But yeah, I thank you so much, Hanno. Uh, it's been really interesting to hear about Personia and how you th- do things. And I think this can give really good insights to kind of startups on how to start building, building their their impact and their sustainability into the company. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Isaac. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And uh, remember to uh, subscribe, comment and rate uh, on all the channels and follow to get more episodes in the future. They will be coming. Thanks. Stay safe.